In the build to Jonathan Hickman's takeover as head of X, Marvel lauded four cornerstones in X-Men history that delivered the kind of imminent change House of X Powers of Ten promised. 1975's Giant Size X-Men, 1991's X-Men No. 1, 1995's Age of Apocalypse, and 2001's New X-Men. Not only is 2001 the most recent comparison, but Grant Morrison's takeover of the X-Men franchise was undoubtedly the most similar in terms of creator star power and uncompromised vision for changing Marvel's Merry Mutants. Of course, it's a lot easier to see those things 15 years removed from Morrison's final new X-Men story, his last work with Marvel, and convenient for the House of Ideas to pretend they didn't desperately try to ignore Morrison's contributions to X-Men from about 2004 to 2011. The reality is that immediately after the conclusion of New X-Men, Marvel announced the X-Men Reload era, a line-wide branding featuring creative team overhauls, new series announcements, the most memorable by far is Astonishing X-Men by Joss Whedon and John Cassidy, and a return to the X-Men of yesteryear. I'm Dave Busing, you're listening to Crack and Krakoa, this is Chuck Austin's X-Men Reload after Grant Morrison. If you like Comic Carol YouTube channel or podcast, please consider liking, subscribing, and sharing. There will be some light spoilers for both Chuck Austin era X-Men and a little bit into the House of X as we look at how the past X-Men stories, some milestones in X-Men history, uh, what they mean for the future of X-Men comics. It's a combination of interesting and sad that after the innovation of Morrison, Marvel's broader editorial decision was, we better tap back into deep nostalgia and conservative, conservative approaches to the franchise. Dirk Deppie writes in an essay for the Comics Journal around the time of Reload, Marvel is currently dolling itself up to be the very spitting image of the girl its audience fell in love with as teenagers. Nostalgia is the name of the game here. The primary direct market readership is between 25 and 35 years of age, and is looking for the same junky thrill they first experience as young nerds reading comics. Now, this is definitely an attitude and I think a, a conversation that continues today. As poorly as this stands up in retrospect, we'll get there in a second, you can almost already see the exact same reaction to a post-Hickman X-Men universe when the publisher, Marvel, announces a, you know, quote-unquote fresh start and back-to-basics approach for the X-Men you used to love. To be a bit fair, Morrison left the X-Men in New York City in some combination of fire and traumatized. <laughs> so it's not like it was an easy ball to keep rolling uphill. Time will tell just how nuclear Jonathan Hickman approaches his story's end. Last time he ended his saga, it was with epitaphs for the Marvel and Ultimate Universes. Nonetheless, you can already see the cries from Marvel readership to wipe the Hickman experiment clean and get back to their X-Men. With that backdrop in mind, what did X-Men Reload have in store? Marvel's Fresh 2020 Complete Collection that just came out presents Chuck Austin and Salvador LaRocca's post-Grant Morrison works across Uncanny X-Men, New X-Men, and X-Men. One thing the Reload Collection doesn't quite do justice is the size and scope of the Reload X line during this era. There's the grand return of Chris Claremont to Uncanny and Excalibur, I mentioned the nostalgia factor here, right? As well as pretty interesting works like the Marvel Knights uh, District X by David Hine and David Yarden, which presents the increasingly important origins of Mr. M, one of uh, only, you know, 14 Omega-level mutants here in the Dawn of X. In short, there's a lot more than Austin LaRocca, but it's these works that are among the most essential in terms of how the X-Men actually tried to move on from, again, Morrison and, and often quietly era. So Austin charges into the Reload era with a head of steam backed by the Draco, aka one of the consensus worst Marvel stories of all time, and, and really without question one of the worst Nightcrawler stories ever, and the Trial of the Juggernaut, aka the story that people like to talk about because She-Hulk asks Juggernaut what he thinks about women's rights, and the next panel is the two of them post-coitus. Austin shows a particular fixation on bringing Kane Marker into the fold as a mostly heroic member of the team throughout his work. Even if you weren't around Chuck Austin's tenure on the X-Men titles, and I sure wasn't as a comics fan, it's hard to be an X-Men fan today and not at least occasionally hear horror stories from fans who lived through it. At the start of Reload, Austin's already nearly 30 issues in two plus years into his run on Uncanny. In his ranking of the best X-Men alternate universes, CBH Comic Herald writer supreme John Galati designated the Austinverse as its own standalone entry because it's easier to process the full run as an alternate reality than to accept that it really happened. 
Before we get into whether all that baggage is really fair in this Reload Comics package, I'll mention broadly that Rock LaRocca's lines and Danny Mickey Inks look more digitally processed than I tend to prefer in comics, but it's very much in line with a lot of Marvel books moving towards the mid-2000s. LaRocca's certainly gone on to produce superior works, I would say Invincible Iron Man with Matt Fraction, or even his very recent Doctor Doom work with uh, Christopher Cam Campbell comes to mind. But unlike the Draco, any story failings here aren't also compounded with intensely dysfunctional X-Men art, right? Like the X, the art is, is quite, at, at worst, very serviceable. You can't really fault the Chuck Austin era for being wholly uninteresting. The first story here, She Lies with Angels, in Uncanny X-Men 437 to 441, was published concurrently with Morrison and Mark Silvestri's final story arc, Here Comes Tomorrow, Morrison's riff on Days of Future Past. Meanwhile, over in Uncanny, Austin and LaRocca were taking their storytelling chances by grafting Romeo and Juliet onto a small story about the Guthrie family in Kentucky. Sam Guthrie probably being the most well-known character here, a.k.a. Cannonball, one of the original members of the New Mutants that he, you know, debuted back in their first graphic novel, uh, circa 19, you know, between 82 and 84, I think 82. Unless you're the world's biggest fan of the Guthrie family, specifically Joss Page and their mom here, this deeply romance-focused poor man's justified with mutants is quite the plotting mess. The most memorable bits stem from Austin's absolute lack of boundaries for public displays of affection, which are hilariously absurd. Midway through the story, Angel and Paige Guthrie reconcile the romance, then fly over her family and the X-Men, and literally just start making love right up over their heads. Shortly before that, Josh and the Catbo girl he loves make out in front of her grandma, causing the grandma to faint on a hardwood floor, and of course, no one pauses to check on her until they're finished making out. There are, again, some very concerning display. I mean, it's played for humor, you know? It's not like it, it's played dead serious or anything like that, but these moments are, are again, hilariously absurd. The rival Cabos find battle armor out in the woods, you know, like you do, and murder Josh Guthrie, causing his Cabo love to drown herself with him, but then Josh heals, classic mutant, and wakes up to find her dead. In more gripping stories, Josh's attempts to now end his own life and inability to succeed due to his healing factor would be absolutely tragic. Same goes for the rocket launch at the Guthrie's that murders only their black family friends. Nightcrawler only has enough porting for the white Guthrie's, which, yikes. Instead, I'm confident history will continue to only remember She Lies with Angels as the time that Warren and Page filmed a public porno. In many ways, it really captures Austin's biggest failings, which is one, the big odd shock value moments, which tend to be the things people remember about his run, and two, really herky-jerky pacing that kind of throws everything off. The rest of Austin and LaRocca's reload work here is deliberately an epilogue to New X-Men number 150. And again, spoilers for the Morrison run uh, you know, ending will follow a little here. I find it inherently more engaging as a follow-up. Honestly, I think this is the entire reason for even putting this collection into the world. The Hickman era of X-Men is quite open about the Morrison new X-Men influence, and for readers making their way through a Marvel Unlimited X-Men binge, you really kind of need Reload to figure out what actually happened in Marvel after new X-Men. Again, like it's this, it's this connective tissue branching you from one era of comics to another. The issues I found most engaging come in the story of Darkest Nights in Uncanny X-Men number 442 to 443. The two-part story is a funeral for Magneto's story with follow-up on Magneto's twist emergence as Zorn in New X-Men. It's interesting to consider Professor X defending Magneto in light of what we know about their grander mutant plans post House of X, right? In the wake of Morrison, the Professor's position to at least provide Eric Lencher the dignity of a respectful funeral on a destroyed Genosha couldn't be less popular. Everyone from Nick Fury to Wolverine calls him on this BS. Now, in the moment, Austin and LaRocca were just delivering, yeah, but he's my pal version of Charlie. But again, with retroactive continuity applied, it's a lot more interesting to think about what's going through Charles Xavier's head as he plots for mutant survival with Moira, and now a deceased Magneto, a completely destroyed Genosha. I mean, how much of this is news to them? How much of this is shocking and throws their plans into disarray? Versus how much of this is sort of calculated by Moira, right? I think those are interesting questions. Again, as we retroactively apply Moira's knowledge through these lifelines to what happened in, you know, previous X-Men comics. Back at the funeral, Bellara shows up after telling Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch that she, you know, has recently confirmed she is Magneto's child too, and she engages in a really interesting argument about the Professor vs. Magneto's approach to mutant rights on Earth. 
Polaris takes the firmest pro-Magneto stance, not necessarily the terror, but the reasons driving to that point, and it's a really compelling argument, honestly. I'm not going to sit here and pretend Austin crafts a perfect speech in favor of revolution, but he's definitely trying to tackle the issue as thoroughly as two issues of a superhero comic will often allow, and I do respect that. Again, like, this is a an attempt at a very serious argument between Professor X and, you know, Polaris as the stand-in for Magneto, and it really gets to the crux of this, you know, disagreement that these two figures have had throughout X-Men history. And again, like in the wake of what happened, Magneto was destroying portions of New York and killing a lot of uh, civilians, you know, it, it has extra weight. The Austin-written issues in New X-Men, aka the, wait, Morrison is done? What's happening? Experience everyone goes through on Marvel Unlimited, are a far less interesting epilogue to Morrison's run starring, you know, Cyclops, Emma, Beast, and the Cuckoos. Following New X-Men number 156, the series rebrands back to X-Men, which I do appreciate removing new since it clearly is not, and Austin and LaRocca contribute X-Men 157 to 164, starting with Day of the Atom. We get a quick POV visit to the X-Mansion via Josh Guthrie's first day at the Xavier Institute. Again, like, if you're a huge Guthrie family stan, then you're going to get a lot of Josh here. You know, we have Scott instilled as the headmaster of the Xavier Institute, which does kick off an interesting era of X-Men and the school specifically without Professor Rex heading up the facility. He moves in the pages of Claremont's Excalibur to Genosha for a spell. The big news here, though, is the X-Men uncover Zorn. There's a lot of talk about Marvel ignoring Morrison's run for years or getting it wrong, but I'll admit I do appreciate Austin and company tackling first Magneto's terrorism, Gene's death, and then what the heck we're supposed to make of Zorn. Unfortunately, Austin et al. are clearly pretty baffled by what to do with the character. And again, fair. Morrison's knot of Magneto masquerading as a fairly compelling Chinese mutant with a black hole for a brain isn't exactly the easiest puzzle left behind. To make sense of all this, Austin invents Zorn's twin brother, who the X-Men yet again rescue from a Chinese prison. So the solution here is that actually there were two of them, one of whom was controlled you know, by Magneto essentially, but there's another Zorn. All told, the Zorn exploration is pretty unsatisfying and directionless, but the major failings here aren't really on Austin's head. It's actually made way worse in Chris Claremont's reloaded Excalibur, in which the series almost immediately brings Magneto himself back from his new X-Men death, declaring the Zorn Magneto an imposter, i.e. one of the twins, and so rapidly resets the long-standing status quo that they are borderline making Morrison's barely cold run in alternate reality. Personally, I'll be interested to see Hickman's take on Morrison's uh, Magneto and the entire Zorn Zorn character. It's There's one with an X, there's one with a Z. How does he reconcile these stories if he feels the need to at all? We've seen this character in Powers of Ten, but how do the twins fit into the Dawn of X? These questions keep the story beats of these comics compelling to me because, again, like these are characters that Hickman has historically found very interesting. They're they're included in his Ultimates run, if you go back to Marvel Cult Comics Ultimates, and, uh, and he's shown them in the early stages of House of X, and then, of course, in Powers, too. So I think we're going to get more. Big picture, this particular story sets up connective tissue from New X-Men back to Uncanny X-Men as the flagship, Mutant Kind heading into the era of decimation after House of M, and Scott Summers' leadership and, of course, the this, you know the saga that that'll take on throughout the decade. All told, it's really only for the X-Heads. You know, most readers will be perfectly well served via, you know, going from New X-Men Morrison style to Astonishing X-Men and then to House of M decimation for the big picture strokes. The lessons of Reload remain compelling, though. It's no great shock that history remembers the new creative blood on Astonishing X-Men fondly and remembers the safest plays hardly at all. It's easier said than done, but following Morrison's new X-Men with an increasingly bold and singular vision from new creators certainly sounds more appealing, and the same will hold true whenever X-Men is ready to resent what's more in the future. Thanks for listening, everybody. I'm Dave. You can find my stuff at comicbookherald.com. Uh, if you're interested in supporting the site and more cracking Krakoa and encouraging me to keep on making these videos, you can go to patreon.com slash comicbookherald. Or if you're not so inclined to do that, uh, just uh, liking and subscribing and commenting and engaging with the channel here helps me out an awful lot. I do want to thank, in particular, the Mysterious Benefactors tier for your immense support. Thank you, Jeff Zacharias, Ron Paul Kirkley, Jesse W., Robert Mickelson, Professor Pride, Steve Brennan, Cole Weathers, Martin Lopez, and Chris 
Isidro. Again, you can find my stuff at comicbookherald.com, at comicbookherald, pretty much anywhere on social, and look for the best comics ever in my Marvelous Year podcast for more. Otherwise, I would love to hear your thoughts on this era, the Chuck Austin written era of X-Men comics specifically, um, and how they might connect for House of X and Dawn of X moving forward, or even just totally different theories that you have working out. Uh, those are always interesting to me as well. So thanks, everybody, for listening, and as always, enjoy the comics.